Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're watching this. Because welcome to this session on machine learning and we're going to be using the Titanic as an example, um, taking passenger details and seeing whether we can predict which passengers would survive and um, which not with um, a very sort of standard methodology uh, in this session called um, logistic regression. Anyway, first of all, in this particular bit, let's just look at how you're going to get to the notebooks we're going to use today, um, how you can install an environment locally, and this will be kind of like a full, a full fat uh, machine learning environment with uh, the big, I guess the big three machine learning libraries, um, scikit-learn, which is uh, used for a lot of more traditional machine learning. And then two neural net libraries. One is TensorFlow uh, from Google, and the other is PyTorch from Facebook. Um, they both do very, very similar things. We're not gonna cover uh, neural networks in this session. That will be in the, the next, the optional advanced session, but we'll get the environment set up so it's all there ready to, to run everything. Great, okay, so let us start by going to pythonhealthcare.org and I'll put all these links in the, mm, the notes below the video. Okay, so this is where we keep a lot of um, code snippets to do various stuff in Python, NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, etc. And Click on the, the top here, uh, just under the main heading, Titanic Survival Machine Learning. OK. Now, what uh, this area is, is there's a whole lot of notebooks, and we'll go in via GitHub in a second, a whole lot of notebooks on classification um, going from well, let's, sorry, let's scroll back up to the top. Uh, going for data pre-processing, which is processing the raw data for this, which came from Kaggle, which I'll mention at the very end of the video, uh, is boring. Um, and then starting with the logistic regression, which is what we're going to do today. And then this, uh, these notebooks, which we're not going to go through all. We're just going to pick out a couple of things to do this session and the next session. But if you're interested in classification, this takes you through a lot of the techniques that are applied in uh, machine learning, um, such as, well, I'll just pick on this one, um, which features, which variables, what information about uh, the passengers or patients or victims, um, if, if uh, you're doing the police stuff or, or criminals, what, what is it about them that's important and which do you not need to, to use in your, your model? So that's feature selection. And all the way through to um, neural networks with PyTorch and TensorFlow. And a link to public service broadcasting there because I rather like them. Okay, so scrolling back up to the, the top, we're going to open up a GitHub repository and hit from here you'll be able to either download everything you need or there will be links to run it uh, on the web in a couple of different ways we'll look at. So let me go to the GitHub repository. Okay, so here we are. So it's all in its own GitHub repository, github.com, Michael Anna, 1966, uh, 2004, underscore um, Titanic. So let's deal with um, installing an environment locally first, um, if you want to do that, which if you're going to be working on your own data, um, it's pretty much essential you do that it's not absolutely essential. You can, you you can use particularly Colab to do to do work on the cloud. You have to accept that's Google, and you are going to upload data to Google. Um, so just be aware if you're if you're using Colab that that's what's going on. They do destroy it all after it, but you know they don't. Have, we don't really know fully sort of how much visibility they have to anything loaded up. Um, okay, so downloading. So we're going to clone 
the repository is the best way to do it. Um, so you would um, download the zip. Let's do it that way. Um, this way, for people who want to get used to working with Git and GitHub, which is a um, version controlling system, um, very powerful. Uh, most people have a love-hate relationship with it. Um, but you can you can sort of clone using SecureShell for those who might be familiar with those that methods. I'm sure that's that's the, always the nicest way to do it. it. Just makes it very easy to pull down any changes, things like that. Okay, so that's downloaded. So you would go to your um, file browser if you're you know in Windows or Mac. Uh, this should all work on all systems. Um, in the past, Mac has not been very good for uh, particularly PyTorch, uh, one of the, the main um, neural network environments. But I think things are now working working on the Mac, but I can't guarantee it. Okay, so I'm going to just uh, say so it's a zip file, so I'm going to extract Windows or Mac will have some something similar to, to uncompress. And so here I've got my Git repository. Um, and that has got all of my notebooks and binder, which we'll look at in a second, because that in includes the information on how to set up the environment. But here we are with, with all the, the notebooks. OK, so let's just go back there. So if you're setting up an environment locally, go to binder, open up binder, uh, and you will see... Uh, there's an environment YAML file, and there's some instructions, text instructions here as here as well. Let me pop those to one side because we use those. Now, so next thing to do if you're on Linux or Mac, uh, just open a plain terminal. If you are on Windows, open Anaconda Command Prompt. I think that's what it's called. Now navigate to where you downloaded. So I'm going to change to, uh, I can see, um, so it's downloads, then 24 Titanic Master. Um, most things I think Anaconda Prompt is the same. Tab complete, once you give it the first few, it'll, it'll then auto complete for you. And I want to go to the binder folder. Okay, so let me just check what's in here. Um, Less or DIR if you're on, on Windows. And I can see I've got my environment YAML file there and my instructions. And the instructions, uh, there's only one line here we, we need, and it's, it's this one here. Uh, the rest tell you about activation, deactivation, which we'll do in a second, um, and also how to, to remove the environment should you get bored of it. I don't need it anymore. So create the environment from, oh, just to remind you about the YAML files. So the YAML file is here. And what it's done, it gives it an environment a name, tells it where to get information from or where to get libraries from. And these are the libraries that it is going to um, import um, to, uh, to run this, this environment. And in this particular case, we give it all the version numbers as well. So when you install the environment on your machine, you get exactly the same environment that I'm using. So that should help it work. OK, let's go back here, have a look at our instructions. And to install this environment, we do conda env create from file hyphen f. And the file is environment.yaml. So it's getting its uh, information here. Um, Downloading and extracting. Uh, Anaconda knows what it's downloaded before, so it'll only download things that are that are new that it's not already got a version of on on your computer. So because I've got most things already installed, that was very fast for you. It might be a bit slower to pull down TensorFlow and, and PyTorch. Okay, and then it just a reminder here: if we want to activate an environment, we conda activate Titanic is what it's called and now we can see we're we're in Titanic.
Titanic. But we'll come back and do that um, later as well. Or you can pick that environment from Anaconda Navigator if you prefer to do it um, that way. Okay, so that's installed our environment. And uh, so there was a question before about just where do environments go? What are they exactly where they go? So let me just quickly show you where where environments are. Let me close that down. In your um, file system, Windows Mac will be the same. You will have a file called Anaconda 3, which you installed, which the Anaconda installer installed. And in that we have our, we have a folder called Envs. And ENVs includes, so these are the environments that I've got running on this particular machine. So we can see uh, our Titanic environment there. And um, if ever something asks you where is the executable Python binary, which you may, depending on what you're doing, you may come across sometime, you go into your environment that you've set up and Python uh, binary is in bin for binary and it is it's just called Python it's got n no other no other extension so we ought to be able to find it here somewhere if I can remember my alphabet there it is Python that's the executable version of Python that it's going to run uh, I believe Python 3 and Python 3.7 are just the same but if we choose Python from here it will activate, well, it will run that version of, of Python. Okay, that's installing the environment. Let's go back to look at our two other ways of doing it. The first is we can run it on um, Binder. So I'm back on GitHub. Dot com Michael Allen 1966 underscore Titanic. We can launch Binder. Now, if this hasn't been used for some time, this will be slow to set up um, because it's got to build the environment for the first time again. It does remember it for, for a day or two. So I'm just going to pause while, while that, that's happening. OK, the binder um, version is being very slow. It's taken half an hour ready and it hasn't set up because it's a big and complex environment and binders slow at setting things up. Um, once it's done it once it should then be faster at least for a couple of days of, of not not being used but while that's doing that let's have a look at the other uh, way of running on the cloud and that is with Google Colab. Um, Colab um, you'll need a Google account to, to access this. Um, has some advantages and some disadvantages. Colab um, has an advantage, it also gives you access to GPUs and what are called tensor processing units, uh, TPUs, and they are good for speeding up neural networks. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, the not so good thing about Google Colab is you don't have as much control over the, the environment as bind of which versions are installed. They it comes with lots of things already installed, like Scikit-Learn, like TensorFlow, and I believe they now put on Py in PyTorch uh, as as well. But let's have a look at that. So I'm going to open in Colab, but it is, a, it is a nice resource, and at the moment it is free. In America, they've just started. So this is where are we? Just to put put us uh, in time. This is November 2020. In America, they have introduced a paid-for version. So if you use the free version, you then get a lower lower performance level. Um, there's just the free version available in the UK at the moment. So I've clicked on um, the link. Sorry, let me just go back there. Um, so I'm back in the Titanic GitHub, and I've clicked on Open in, in Colab here. You can also just Google Colab. And this is a link to the it can open up a GitHub repository, which is which is a nice thing. Um, and when it comes to the exercise today here, there's a black basically a blank notebook that loads up some data for you that you can work work in this. So it's all live. This is a little bit ugly to find the files um, we want. Um, we want to go down to. Um, 
HSMA tutorial one. So they're in alphabetical order here. Um, so if I then click on that, right, that'll bring up our first worksheet, that so first notebook that that we'll we'll talk through. Right, let's see what what's happening with Binder. Um, launch attempt one failed retrying so i'll pause the oh there we go all right well that was perfect timing uh, so binder's been been slow um this looks more like jupyter the um, right from the front page so here this is the github repository this is what you'd see kind of locally if you were opening it up and if we go to jupyter notebooks our uh and we could scroll down to hsma tutorial one and open that okay so you've got the three options there for this you can install your environment locally and that's going to be good if you want to do your own work uh, work with google colab which is a nice free resource not so much control over environments so you may find an old notebook suddenly stops working because it, they've changed versions of one of the libraries behind the scenes and you don't know and it breaks um, and then you can also run on um, Binder, Binder Hub here. So uh, pick whichever you want, get it up and running, um, then pause now, go and get yourself a cup of tea, coffee, something stronger if it's the evening, um, uh, or even if it's the morning. Um, it's that kind of year. Uh, and we'll pick up and we'll go through an introduction to, to machine learning in the next section. Okay, <clears throat> so let's quickly look at what is machine learning. Let's open up our notebook. So I'm using Google Colab um, here. Uh, let's hope it works. Tutorial one, HSMA tutorial one, and types of machine learning. Let's uh, let's consider that. So, what's machine learning, and what's the difference between machine learning and AI? And these are this is a common question. What's the difference between machine learning and, and AI? And there's an awful lot of overlap between the two, um, but there are differences as well. Um, let's have a think about the game of chess, for example. Now, back in, oh, I can't remember when it was, uh, but IBM produced their sort of computer chess playing um, machine called Deep Blue that beat the world champion Garry Kasparov um, at the time, much to his chagrin. Um, now that was arguably AI, because it, it was felt, especially once you, a machine had mastered uh, chess, it had mastered intelligence. Then uh, of course found out that just because a machine can pl play chess doesn't mean that it can do anything useful, anything else useful whatsoever. But arguably it, was, you know, it, it met the criteria for accomplishing something that we associate with human intelligence. And that is playing playing chess. Um, so Deep Blue was AI, but it wasn't machine learning in that it didn't learn itself from experience um, to to play chess. It was programmed to play chess. It was programmed to search extensively into the future what possible moves. Uh, how would it rate those boards, so score, uh, board scoring algorithm, and to look at a vast library of um, move sequences that had been used in um, previous games, expert uh, by, by champion chess players. So that was sort of programmed AI, but you could run Deep Blue from now to the end of time and it, it wouldn't get any better by itself. It was pre-programmed between games with Garry Kasparov, which was one of his um, objections to uh, uh, to the games between him and, and IBM. 
um, he thought that was um, cheating. Um, okay, so that's AI. Now, machine learning has an overlap with that. If we look, for example, at um, Google DeepMind learning to play um, Go, and I'll put a link down below to a wonderful um, movie, um, 90 minutes or so, um, on that whole story of Google DeepMind um, uh, headed by David Silvers and against Lee Sodell, the, the, the Go champion. Everybody comes out well from it. You know, it's a lo lovely thing to watch. Um, uh, that learned by playing and it learned by playing and losing and playing and winning and it, they spent a lot of time with it playing itself and learning. It would also search into the future as well. Uh, possible games but it learned and the longer it is trained for in games playing itself or playing champions the better it gets so that's machine learning machine learning learns from data uh, and uh, often it's just a sort of fixed set of data you give it but it can be data that's updated or in the case of games reinforcement learning which we'll look at um, in another section it's um, trial and error, learning, trying stuff, getting rewards for whether that was good or not in, in the long term or short term, um, and then refining algorithms to, to produce better results. So that's difference between the two. Machine learning is active learning. Uh, more data, more experience leads to better results, whereas AI can also be programmed like in Deep Blue um, Chess or um, Chatbots are often series of kind of they got hundreds of thousands of if somebody says this then say that so it, it doesn't learn in that type of chatbot it it's programmed AI but it appears human like so we we, we classify it generally in the sort of AI AI field okay so back to machine learning and there are basically three areas that are broadly considered to be parts of machine learning. And the first one I'm going to start with is on the top right here, supervised learning. So that's what we're going to focus on to today. And that divides into two general areas, classification and um, regression. And they're very, very similar. Um, we're going to concentrate on classification today. So classification might be, well, is given this data about a particular case, it could be a patient or it could be a an area of the country. Um, in our case today, it's going to be a passenger of the Titanic. Can you classify it in some way? So, for example, will our Titanic um, traveller likely survive or likely not? Will a patient likely be readmitted uh, within the next few weeks or, or not? Um, is an area likely to be an unusually high crime area? Um, or not. Uh, so it's kind of, and all those cases are, are binary classifications, one or the other, but it can be sort of multiple, multiple levels of classification or, or different things. Is this a cat or a dog or a rabbit um, or any number? So that's classification. It's are you one thing or, or another or from a series of, of choices? And you can give probabilities you know it's not either one thing or the other it's not like you say this person will be readmitted into hospital you can say we think this person has a 70 percent probability of being readmitted into hospital um, so we get out of classification and probability uh, regression is very similar but rather than having classes it's a continuous variable that that come that comes out um, so here we've got estimating life life expectancy because that's not a, um, a discrete choice unless you chunk bind it into one year intervals that kind of overlaps with classification but we might say well your life expectancy we think is i don't know 15 months uh, or whatever uh, or house prices given information about a house can you predict it, its price so the two are very similar and we'll we'll look at those those two briefly as we start this um, so supervised learning is probably the biggest one, certainly one of the biggest area for machine learning. Uh, it, it's very common. Um, the second area is called unsupervised learning, which lots of people say is not named 
well. Oh, supervised learning, I should say. This, going back to why it's called supervising, you have a lot of examples, and those examples from the past have um, a label um, or a value attached to them. So we'll have information around individual patients on the Titanic and whether they survived or not. And so we use that data to train a model then to predict the survival rate or survival of individual passengers who we're not given the label for or we, we don't use the label for. We can then check whether our model is right against those. Um, or we might, the example in the exercise, if you choose to do the exercise uh, with this session, it's um, the label is whether somebody who's had a stroke was given a clot busting drug or not. And can you predict which patients at which hospitals would be given a clot busting drug um, or not? So we have a whole lot of labelled values. Or here with um, this plane regression, um, we might know historically what house prices were for individuals. So you've got five bedrooms, you've got this much land, whatever, and you sold for this much. So that's our supervised part of it in that we got data um, and our job is to predict examples that we haven't seen before from examples that that we have been given data, full data for. So unsupervised learning, uh, there are two areas of this which are it's kind of a bit different really. So the, the first major one um, is um, clustering and this is basically grouping data so given a whole lot of patients go away and find clusters of them and so in those clusters they are going to be similar in some way um, but it's not by any label we give it it's just go away and find similar things so clustering might for example if you give it a whole lot of photos of animals hopefully well it might cluster cats together and then dogs together and depending on the size of the cl how many clusters you have maybe it puts cats and dogs together in one cluster but the birds in another cluster so that's clustering and clustering is either discrete groups or it can be sort of hierarchy of how you would divide um, all the examples up um, so for example if it's cats dogs and birds maybe the first division would put cats and dogs together and birds separately and then the cats and dogs or maybe it would separate cats and dogs um, or maybe it would separate black animals from yellow from brown animals and you'd have a mixture of cats and dogs in, in, in either. so clustering um, can be used <coughs> then you you kind of looking for what might be interesting in those those clusters it's called unsupervised because we don't have a particular label um, but we do have lots of data around them, around them it's just that we're not trying to divide them in any particular way we let the the computer divide it up and then the second one is dimensionality reduction um, which is a fancy way of saying look i've got a hundred features to describe this passenger um, can I reduce that down to say 10 important ones? And those 10 might be either selecting uh, the most important features of the passenger that we know say will predict whether they uh, survive or not, or it might be a way of combining various features together um, in some way um, so that you can compress a hundred features down to down to 10 and then your models can work um, more more efficiently um, we won't be talking so much about that and then the final area is reinforcement learning and this I think is one of the most exciting emerging areas this is the game playing plus but also um, you can use it for sort of well, we're looking at it in healthcare, for example. Two examples we're looking at is can it learn in a simulation when to um, activate escalation policies in a hospital and when also to activate de-escalation policies because escalation policies can cost money. So these are the policies that you activate when your hospital's getting too full. So you might open another ward, which is obviously going to take some time. You might cancel elective operations, which is 
good for your hospital capacity but bad for those patients who are, we're going to have their, their procedure. And can an agent learn to do that? And the other area we're looking at is can an agent learn to control where ambulances go when they're not, when they're between calls in order to minimise the, um, the response time to, to incidents. Can intelligent agents learn those sort of things? So that's reinforcement learning, but we'll have a, have a separate um, section on that. Okay, so that's supervised classification regression, unsupervised. People often mean clustering by unsupervised, but may also mean dimensionality reduction and then reinforcement learning. There are three big areas of, of machine learning, or at least they are in November 2020. It's a fast moving area. So, you know, come back in a year's time, maybe there's another blob coming coming out here of something new discovered. Okay, so that's the three areas. Um, take a pause, uh, just have a think through that. If you want to have a look at, look at um, the, the diagram there, um, there's also a link. This picture came from uh, technovert.com, Introduction to Machine Learning. Have a look at that if you want. Then we'll come back and we'll start looking at classification um, and where we might where we might use it. Okay, classification. Um, so with classification, we're seeking to classify some something, somebody into various classes, two, two or more um, classes. So examples could be, um, what diagnosis should this patient be given? Can a machine, can a machine learn that? And remember also with probabilities. Because um, one option is, with because there's always a tension or potential for tension between machines and people. But machines might be able to be sort of trusted or people might feel happy to trust machines more with, well, rule out the simple stuff and then give the more complex stuff where the machines can't distinguish. Is this cancer? Is this not cancer? If it's a, a diagnosis, for example, um, to an expert to, to, to look at. Um, in fact, it's quite a bit of interesting work at the moment with machines diagnosing cancer from, from images and um, basically the best results are when you've got a new AI machine and consultant radiologists to, together. Um, they actually have better performance than either um, independently. Um, so what pi diagnosis should the patient be given? Um, what's the probability that an emergency department will breach four hour waiting in the next two hours? Do we care about four hour waiting anymore? I can't remember. Um, what treatment should a patient be given is an example. And an example we're doing research on at the moment, one of our projects, is can we predict what treatment a patient would have received if they had gone to another hospital? Um, that might be considered a sort of centre of excellence in, uh, in that particular condition. So we start to compare clinical decision making between hospitals uh, while taking into account that different hospitals see different mixes of, of patients. You know, the patients in North Devon, for example, on average are significantly older than patients attending London hospitals, for example. So you need to um, allow for that case mix. Um, what's the probability that a patient will be, be readmitted? Uh, you might be interested in, in that, or if you're a GP, somebody, uh, so, you know, what's the probability of a patient that you're looking after be admitted into hospital in the next, you define the time period, and you can build the model to, to provide that answer. So what I'd like you to do is just pause yourself for, for you know, three or four minutes, something like that, and just think, can you think of three occasions where people in your area make classifications about something in your hospital, police area, GP, whatever. Um, so just to get you sort of thinking, because we're going to be talking about passengers on the Titanic today, but you start to see this is an incredibly broad area. It's a whole lot of data, and I want to say this is likely to be this, that, or the other, or probabilities. 
Um, so have a think, just where are people already making classifications? And can you think of an example where it might be useful to provide a new automated classification of, of, of some kind uh, that's not, not currently being, being done? Okay, so just pause and have a think of those, then we'll come back and look at um, regression and then how logistic regression uh, helps us classify things. Okay, so hopefully you've had a think through where classification exists in your environment and where maybe there's some extra classification that if you could do, could be useful. Um, so now let's just uh, take a quick look at regression and logistic regression. So these are the two, two arms of supervised learning, if you like. We're gonna concentrate on classification, log logistic regression today. So with ordinary regression, we're trying to predict a value of something, the, the price uh, that a house will sell, as an example, given a num one or more other features. So the very simplest one is you are given a variable x and you will predict y and you, you work out, you assume there's a straight line link between the two. So that's sometimes called ordinary least squares, linear regression. Um, and everything's always a straight, straight line in that kind of um, regression. It doesn't, things don't have to be modeled a straight line in regression. For example, here we've, we've got a model that is predicting a value, whatever this is, um, given an input of x and we've got a bit of a curvy line and we do that by introducing what are called polynomial terms basically we we have something y is some function of x plus some function of um, x squared plus some function of x cubed and then onward x to the 10 if you if you want um, so that's called a polynomial regression um, and when you bring in more than one feature, so for house prices, for example, it could be how many bedrooms have you got? Could be one. What's the square area, square foot area of the house? Could be another. What's the size of the garden? Could could be another. That sort of thing. Um, then you, that's a multiple um, regression, and you can combine the two. You can have multiple polynomial, which will take multiple features and non-linear relationships and predict a value of y given a set of input variables or features we tend to call them in machine learning x that's ordinary regression with logistic regression it actually uses it shares a lot of the same foundations but then we add a a trick to convert the output instead of a, a straight line which linear regression um, will, will give we add a trick by adding in a sigmoid an s shaped curve that it will always convert a linear regression line into some kind of 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 sigmoid and that sigmoid will always the output will always go between zero and one and we model our, we optimize our model so that we get a probability outcome between zero and one. So one would mean uh, I'm absolutely certain this passenger would have died on the Titanic, or I am absolutely certain they would have um, survived if they're if they're very close to zero, for example. If if this is the probability of dying, um, and then in between we get we get the 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 sigmoid um, shape here and we do that by introducing this equation term which you you don't need to worry about but this forces uh, the e to the power of a plus bx over one plus e to the a plus bx will give you a this shape where e is a constant 
um, it's defined, it's a physical or mathematical constant. Um, and then a plus bx, a will effectively shift the curve left uh, and right, um, and uh, b will affect how um, steep or, or shallow um, that that probability curve is in relation to, to x. So this is the general form for a, a logistic um, equa regression equation, but you don't need to work to worry about that. And um, then just if you're 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 into this sort of thing, this compares the equations just to show they're very closely related. We take a linear model, um, so our output y would be um, some constant b0 plus some function or constant b1 multiplied by either value of our first feature x1 and then for each of the features will have its own sort of multiple sometimes called co coefficient uh, in statistics or it's called weight in machine learning so we multiply our feature value by our weight for that feature um, and then add up all of those and that effectively gives you a straight line and then the logistic regression trick if you like is to create a logistic model um, using this conversion of 1 over 1 plus e to the minus of the, the, the value that we've got up here and it just converts a linear regression model into a logistic regression model if you're interested in the maths but you don't need to know the maths okay that's logistic and linear regression just have a have a think through that for a moment and then in the next section before we actually start on the titanic um, example just going to um, take one thing independently which is what's called scaling data so for example i mentioned house prices uh, if you've got a um, house prices and you're counting bedrooms maybe that goes between naught or one and six maybe naught and six um, but then our square feet may go from you know i've no idea what houses are in square feet i don't know a thousand to two thousand to twenty thousand so we've got one on a scale of one to six and we've got another on the scale of tens of thousands and we actually normally for fitting these things we want to bring everything into a reasonably common scale so all the features get scaled into a similar range as each as each other so come back we'll just look at feature scaling before then we go on to the the, the main um, titanic uh, model okay Okay, let's look at data scaling, uh, feature scaling. Uh, and we'll just pick a very simple example just to see what we're talking about and uh, how we deal with features that are on very different, um, very different scales potentially. So let's start running. I'm running in Colab. So I'm going to uh, start by importing a couple of our favorite libraries. So you'll see libraries we use again and again. So matplotlib and numpy. So let me run that. Gives me run run warning. Uh, this notebook was not authored by Google. Uh, do we want to trust it? Perhaps they ought to give that warning if it was authored by Google. Anyway, run that. Just okay. So that's imported. So let's create uh, two sets of data with different means and different standard deviations. Um, so I'm using the um, NumPy random generator and they're going to be normal and this is going to be my mean and standard deviation and how many samples to produce. Okay, so that's produced that. Let's have a quick look. Um, how do we add a new cell in Colab? Uh, let's try insert code below. Yep. So if we do X1, and I'm going to look at, um, let's look at the first 10 examples. So we have an array here, and we can see sort of, well, they're all here, they're between about 
35 and 65-ish, something like that. Let me add another cell below. Let's just try escape B. Yep, add a cell below. Now if I look at X2 and just look at the first 10 examples, um, we can see these numbers are, are higher. Um, and that's, let's also plot them. So uh, here's one you won't use very often with Matplotlib, but it's nice. And this is one of those occasions where you can actually use it. For those who know the XKCD cartoons, you'll recognize what it does to the plot. It puts it in a sort of XKD style. Um, and we do that in Matplotlib simply with, with plot, XKCD and the rest. It'll, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it'll make sense in a, in a couple of minutes time when, when we plot it. You can see what it does. It just changes the style um, of it. So, uh, Matplotlib, I'm going to set up our figure, uh, which is the overall kind of rectangle it's going to put things in, if you like, and our axe, which is our, in this case, our single um, plot within it, and I can specify it's um, going to be 8 by 5 inches. Here I could also specify, uh, I'll remove this in a second, if I wanted to produce it at 300 dpi. 600 dpi. I could also do that when saving, but just as a sort of reminder, Matplotlib is very powerful, particularly for producing publication quality results. We can specify things, things like that. Okay. Um, I'm going to add a, what I want is, I'm going to plot a histogram of x1 and a histogram of x2. So I specify, Matplotlib has a histogram method built in. Here's our data. We can tell it how many bins we want, or it will um, it will do that automatically if you want. Alpha is transparency or opacity. I can never remember which. I can't remember whether if you put one, it makes it really dark or completely transparent. Um, but it doesn't matter when it's 0.5. Anyway, you can just try and see what it does. Color is blue, and I'm going to give it um, a label, which will go in a legend. And then I'm going to do the same with um, X2. It's another histogram, all exactly the same, um, except different data set. I'm going to add some labels to um, my axes, X label and Y label. Add a legend, which will take our labels from here. And then finalize the plot and show, which I think you don't have to do in plot in Jupyter Notebooks anymore, except I, I, I'm out of habit, I guess, and completeness. I always just do that. So let's let's run that and see what we get. Okay. So that's our plot, and XKD, XKCD gives us these sort of wobbly, wobbly axes and borders and cartoonish style stuff. So, I don't know just made writing this a bit more fun to do that so anyway here's our two data sets so we have our um, data set one and we can see it's got a lower mean the the, the center of it um, and also it's um, less spread so it's tighter so a lower standard deviation here's our x2 so we've got both a higher mean and the data is more spread out so a, a greater greater standard deviation. So mean describes where the center is, standard deviation describes its um, spread or variance around that, that mean. Now these aren't massively different but we could look at more extreme examples. But what we want to do for most machine learning techniques, not all but most, it is an advantage often to put things on similar scales. So let's see how we can do that. The, the first one is to normalize by its own minimum and maximum. And the minimum becomes zero and the maximum becomes one. So here, the minimum is going to be, I don't know, actually you can't, can't be sure from the graph, but it's going to be perhaps 10 up to 70 for x1 
and for x2 the minimum seems to be maybe about 40 unless there's some we can't see and the maximum about 230 something like that so um, we can say our normalized uh, value and we call our normalized value um, z here um, is x at each value minus the minimum of uh, all the x's and then we divide that by the the range um, the max minus the min um, and that's going to scale everything between 0 and 1 sometimes you can people scale between minus 1 and 1 that's less common um, uh, but you can see the, the equation for that um, here is, is, is very similar. We just expand it out. We multiply our 0 to 1 by 2 and then add that to minus 1. And then that, that kind of spreads our 0 to 1 out from between minus 1 and, and 1. So you see that sometimes, but not often. Um, so we'll use normalization. We'll plot this in a second, but here we are. That's done. Let's just add... So let's look at our x1 norm and we'll look at our first 10 values. And hopefully we should see they're all in the range 0 to 1. And similarly, if we do x2 norm, um, tab complete there, which your point notebook does, 0 to 10. And these are all in the range um, between 0 and 1. In fact, they tend to be more clustered. The ones we've looked at, the examples we've got, are more clustered around 0.5, which we might, ex might expect, um, or we should expect for something that normally distributed like this. Most of the values are close to the mean, which will become 0.5 in our um, normalised uh, array here for a normally distributed um, set of features. Okay, so that's min-max normalization. Min-max normalization is most is the one you would commonly use if you are using neural nets. Now, there's another one which is slightly harder to get your head around, I think, um, but it's the common one used in logistic regression, and it's called standardization. We'll see what each of these these does in a, in a plot in a moment. Now, standardization, we scale all of our features such that all of them have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And that is called standard deviation. So they don't be, go between naught and one. They'll be centered on naught. We'll have a whole lot of negative um, values and a whole lot of positive values. A standard deviation of one. May, will mean that about two-thirds of the values will have a value between minus one and plus one. About 95% of the values, something like that, will have a value between um, minus two and plus two. And then about, no, I think it's 99.7% are within three standard deviations, so they'll be between minus three and three. And then we can have some extreme outliers, if you like, but they'll be rare, the values of below minus three or above plus three, but there'll be, there'll be exceptions. And standardised data, if we're doing it manually, I should say, Later on, we'll use a library or a method from Scikit-Learn to do this automatically for us. Um, just handles things like errors a bit, bit nicer. But we can do it manually. To standardise, we subtract the mean from all values. And that gives us a new mean of zero if we subtract the mean from everything. You might want to sort of play around with that and convince yourself of that, that fact. And then we divide those values through by the standard deviation of the original data set so and this will now will have a this top bit gives us a mean of zero by subtracting the mean from everything this bottom bit dividing everything through by the standard deviation will of the original data set will give us a standard deviation of one in our standardized data set 
Um, so let's do that and then let's just manually and uh, so I should have said follow along please you know if, if uh, in whatever way you prefer so now if I look at x1 standard deviation uh, 0 to 10 I'm expecting them most values to be between well at least minus 2 and 2 say but I'm going to get negatives and positives uh, unless I've got an odd sample from the first 10. Let's have a look. Yeah, so we've got um, most of them. Yeah, what well, we've got one here, minus 2.3. I mean, it's going to be the ones outside of minus 3 to 3 that are going to be really rare. They can occur, though. Um, so we've got mixture of minus and positive values sort of around 0. And if we do the same for x2 standardized, we should see something similar. Yeah, so again we've got um, we got values clustered around clustered each around zero but um, ranging here from minus two up to point point seven. Uh, let's have a look at the whole the whole data sex that's just convinces us just by looking them yeah it looks like we're doing something reasonable here. Um, so let's plot those so we can call this a, tra a way of transforming data or normalizing data. If somebody says standardizing data, they probably mean or should mean specifically this way of normalizing the data, subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. So standardized data you would expect to have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Normalized is a more generic term. Um, we might normalize with min-max normalization or with standardization. So let's plot this uh, with our XKCD again. Um, we're going to set up three subplots here uh, in matplotlib. Um, so this is one, there are various ways of doing things in matplotlib. So one of, it's very powerful. One of the frustrations can be that there often isn't a very standard way of doing things. This is going to create three axes or subplots within one figure. Our figure is going to be one subplot tall by three subplots wide. So we can obviously change that. If you had two by two it would give you four in a kind of square format. And our fig size is going to be 12 inches wide by five inches tall. And we refer to each subplot by its axes and then its index, which here is zero. So here we're going to plot the original data with a histogram. We're now going to, in the middle plot, going to plot the normalized um, plot. I might call that minmax normalized. In fact, in the yeah, in the um, uh, in the title, I've put minmax normalized. And then our final plot is going to be the standardized um, data. Um, when you're plotting subplots, you can you can twiddle with how closely they abut each other, and sometimes you kind of have to fiddle with this sort of padding, tight layout, and then adjust the padding to get it looking just right, depending on font sizes and whether it they're kind of running into each other or not. So just know if you're doing subplots you will commonly do fig tight layout, pad equals and then fiddle with the, the padding. It's normally 0, 1, 2, maybe 3 you want to use and then we'll show that. Okay so let's have a look at that. So here is our normalized. So here's our original data on its different scale. Here is the min max data so you can see it's brought it much closer together, but um, because the minimal, the max, um, is sort of a bit um, different compared to where, where the mean is in each data set, we haven't quite got them sort of perfectly normalised. Um, but don't worry about that. So, you know, if, you're, if you want them bang 
slap on top of each other. We can see on the right the standardized data is actually better. This just bring for machine learning, bringing them into roughly the same range is normally good enough, fine. So this one, min-max normalized, isn't performing as well as the standardized data, but we wouldn't actually worry too, too much about that. Um, though for logistic regression, we would normally use standardized data anyway. Perhaps you could try using min-max normalized and see, does it make any difference whatsoever? Um, you might be able to get away with the original data as well. Sometimes you can, sometimes it, uh, it throws out some not so good results. So just some notes on scaling. Um, we're not going to cover decision of trees and random forests in the couple of tutorials we're giving you, though they are a common machine learning technique, but you don't need any scaling. Scaling won't affect them at all. Um, linear regression and support machine, support vector machines, which we're also not going to cover, the support vector machines, um, tend to use a standardized um, input data and neural networks will most commonly use min-max normalized um, data. Um, just a note to say, um, when we... No, I won't cover that, because we'll, we'll be talking about that um, very, very shortly. Um, so there's an, an exercise here. Oh, I've just noticed on this one I need to resave it. You can actually see what it see what it says. Um, have a go yourself at scaling um, it between minus one and one. So very similar and have a plot of plot of that. Just just get you used to doing a bit of uh, you know bit more numpy and such like um, or carry on without that but it's a useful exercise to do you know, it, it shouldn't be hard and you should be able to pretty much copy and paste the coding uh, for um, plotting it so have a go at that okay so if you have a look at that grab yourself coffee have a break have a walk around say hello to somebody um, and then we will start on actually the titanic data so see you in a bit Okay, Titanic survived. Let's get on to the, the meat of all of this. Um, just start with, uh, while I remember, uh, recommendation. Um, if you want to get into machine learning, um, I thoroughly recommend um, this book. It's incredible in its breadth of what it covers. Hands-on machine learning with scikit-learn, Keras and TensorFlow. Um, by Ariel and Geron. You can see I bought it um, twice, and in fact I also bought um, the Kindle version. Um, yeah, it's, and I always have a copy sitting around um, near my desk. It's very good. Um, okay, so... And I don't get any royalties for recommending it. Let's start then. Let's go to pythonhealthcare.org, click on Titanic Survival, um, go to the GitHub repository, I'm going to open in Colab, and the book, the notebook we're going to be using is HSMA Tutorial 2. Okay, let me make this a bit... Uh, bit bigger right so we're going to try and predict which passengers would survive on the Titanic when we build a model we train on a certain data set and those have got labels so it's got the passengers and it's got whether they survived or not um, and then, but we then test on examples that are not used to train the model. And that's really, really, first off, I'd sort of emphasize that, and I'll emphasize that several times. You do not test models on data you have used to train models. 
um, because you'll get an artificially optimistic um, view of, of your model. So you always want to put some data um, aside um, for, for testing. Now this data comes from um, Kaggle. We'll come back to Kaggle at the, the very end because it's a wonderful source of data sets if you want to sort of have a play with stuff from, from mm, all sorts of areas and see how people might have tackled a machine learning problem. And this is one of their, their classic ones, which is um, uh, Titanic survival. So here's the original um, data data set and there's also a link here to where I'd stored it locally sort of after processing it. Uh, <coughs> I think we use a slightly different source than that. Um, so the data includes so uh, about so for each passenger on the Titanic whether they survived or not, the ticket class, um, what gender they were, how old they were, number of siblings and spouses aboard the Titanic, number of parents and children aboard the Titanic, their ticket number, their passenger fare, their cabin number, and um, they whether where they embarked, uh, Cherbourg, Queenstown, or Southampton. Um, so here we've got a sort of categorical data and We've done all the pre-processing of the data for you. Typically, when you've got categorical, categorical, if I can say it, data like this, for models such as um, logistic regression and neural networks, you convert it to what is called one-hot data. And one-hot data replaces a single column with three columns. Did you embark at Cherbourg, Queenstown, or Southampton as individual columns one of those will be positive, assuming you know where they embarked from, and the others have to be negative if it's one hot encoding. You can't embark in this way of encoding at both Cherbourg and Queenstown. Um, and that's fair enough because the original data would only list one of those, those three. So logistic regression, there's a couple of um, links here for uh, you to understand more if you like uh, wikipedia as ever is a pretty good sort of data source on or information source on machine learning type stuff and introductory material and there's also a youtube uh, video here to to watch so those will give you more background on logistic regression um, we're going to focus more on the mechanics in this session of how you do it um, so we're going to take a range of features. This is our, our features are all of the data that we've got. These are, um, so statisticians might call them variables, machine learners will call them features. And then we've got a label that we're, we're trying to predict survival or not. So we're going to take data from that and then we're going to normalize them and then we're going to fit a logistic re regression model. So we're going to go through the, the following steps, and these steps are common to all these type of models. First of all, we're going to download and get our data. We're going to um, pre-process if needed, and that can be a painful part, actually. And things like how are you going to fill in missing data, and stuff like that. But we're putting that aside for this session, and um, we're giving you pre-processed data. Then we split our data into our features, commonly called X, capital X to indicate it's a matrix in that we've got more than one um, feature. If it was a little X by convention, that would mean it was a single feature, big X, more than one feature. And our label we're going to have as Y, so we split those apart. Then we're going to split our data into training and test sets. So remember we're going to train the model on a set of data and we're going to test it on data that wasn't used to train the model. And typically you would keep back 20 to 30 percent for testing and use 70 to 80 percent for for training. 
We will then standardize our data. So that's just as we, we've been looking at, normalizing the data, and we'll use standardization here. Subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation. But we'll use a library method from sklearn to do that. We then have fit a logistic regression model. And you can see that in all of the code we're talking about this morning, the actual model fitting will be one line of code. Um, magic from, from scikit-learn, sklearn. Uh, then we use our model to predict the survival of our test set and we assess the accuracy on the test set. And then we can review our model coefficients, as statisticians might call it, or, or weights, as um, machine learners will call it, and we can see the importance of each of the, the features and uh, the relationship between that feature and the probability of survival. And rather than just as having a, an individual, um, did you, do we think you'll survive or not, we'll end up just looking, but looking at the probability of survival. Remember, logistic regression gives us this number between zero and one, which is a probability of being one class or the other. And most commonly, you will take um, a value of 0.5 as your cutoff. You don't have to. Um, we can talk about that uh, probably at another time, maybe in the second session. Um, you can sort of bias towards, well, if there's a, if you're screening, you'll, you'll perhaps pick a lower probability before classifying somebody to progress to the next stage of um, investigation. Okay, so those are our steps. Download pre-processed data, split into features, label, split into training and test sets, standardize the data, fit the model, predict from our test set, so our test features, and assess the accuracy against our test set, review our model weights, look at the importance of features, and have a look at probability. So we're using a um, standard Anaconda install um, that would have all of these things included. Um, the, the libraries we're going to use, NumPy, Pandas, and Scikit-learn, SKLearn, is a library that has tons of useful stuff in mach machine learning um, for helping you pre-process data, and also a lot of the standard models, so logistic regression, sport vector machines, random forests uh, are in there. It has a neural net um, component as well, but people don't use it really for neural nets. For that, we use TensorFlow or PyTorch. So let's import. Whoop. Shift enter or click on the, the play. That's going to import our libraries. Now we're going to load the data because this is on the cloud. Um, the data doesn't yet exist on Google Colab, is the way just the way Google Colab works. So this download required is true. You will need if you're running on Google Colab. And if you run Google Colab, you'll always need a way of bringing in your data. If you saved it locally um, already, you don't need the download. Um, having said that, it won't do any harm if you do, do run this. So I'm going to download data. That's it. It's downloaded it uh, from um, the interwebs. Um, and it's also saved it to a local um, folder that it's set up. And I'm going to load it from that local folder. So if you had already had, if you didn't need to download it, this will upload it from your local storage. So now we have our, our data. The other thing I've put in here that's quite, I found quite useful to do is to convert all the data to begin with into a common data type. And so what I've said is data as type, this is called casting and it casts all of our data because I know I'm going to be dealing with numeric data because that's what I've got in my, my pre-processed data. Um, this would lose text, but because I know I've got all numbers, I'm going to convert them all to the same type, float. You just find sometimes you run into a problem where, which is solved by just having them all in the same data format. Okay, so I load that. 
Actually, I've just done that, haven't I? Now let's examine. Um, it's loaded it by reading it in into a pandas data frame, which is a very nice way of loading CSVs. Behind the scenes, it's, it's doing lots of stuff for you and dealing with any peculiarities in the data often. Um, so if you've got CSVs, I always use pandas for each CSV to read them in. And then let's look at our first 10 rows. Okay, here we are. So here's our um, index. We have a passenger ID which I think Kaggle will probably will get rid of that because it's an artificial one. So survived, zero means died, um, and one means um, survived. Um, and then we've got which class were you in, uh, what was your age, number of siblings or partners on board, number of parents, or children was that yes how much did you pay um, this also age imputed means it was missing originally and we've added it in and we've so this is in the pre-processing and that is in the github repository and also from the python healthcare titanic homepage you can go and see what pre-processing was done you can when you are fitting machine learning methods i think all of them uh, the standard methods. You can't have empty cells. You have to have something in them and you can decide how you're going to fill in missing data, what we call imputation. And this is actually labelling whether it was imputed. So here one means the age was missing originally, but it's given it a, an age of 28. Commonly you will either use the mean or median or you will sample from um, age distribution. So those are two common ways of dealing with uh, with it. And then the cabin actually it splits into cabin um, number and letter um, and then whether it's imputed or not if we didn't have a cabin number, mail and then this is the one hot encoding embarked at Cherbourg can't remember the others. Anyway, Southampton and something being in the queue. So this this takes categorical data, one hot encode. So one is one and the others are zero. Um, or it might be missing. So one hot encoding, if you go to the um, pre -pro data pre-processing, Pandas has methods for doing that for you. I mean, you could write a little bit of code to do it yourself or pandas will do it for you. And pandas also tells you if that column was empty, um, missing. So when it one hot encodes, it will include a missing column if it needs to and fill, fill that in. Now we've got our cabin, cabin letters in case they're important um, and cabin letter missing. So that's our, that's our data. So pandas has a, a handy method um, for, particularly when you first get a set of data and read it into a pandas data frame then the describe method um, don't forget open close brackets for almost all all of pandas methods um, and what this will do is for each of the um, features it will tell you how many it's got What's the mean? What's the standard deviation? Um, so here, for example, our mean passenger ID, I'm not I'm going to use that. Uh, so our, our average class is 2.3. Our average uh, age is 29. So these are on different scales. So this is a warning that we we'll probably want to use standardization here um, to bring them all onto the same same scale. Um, so we can we can get a general feel for for our for our data here. The other one that can be quite useful um, as well, even before doing data describe. So let me put it above scape A to put a one is data dot info, and this will give us more technical information about the. Um, 
the, the data that's there. So we've got 891 and non-null, so not empty for each of them. So it lists the columns, tells us how many are empty, and because we've pre-processed it, this data, none of them are, and what's our data type, and we've already converted them all to float. So data.info is, is a very useful one to do as well, um, to begin with, particularly before you pre-process, to kind of get a feel for uh, how, many, how much is missing, have you got strange mixtures of data types in there that need dealing with. Then data describe is more statistical. Right, um, we're going to drop the passenger ID, this first one, which was just numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, because, well, maybe the order in which they're entered perhaps are important, but it, it's an arbitrary number, and so I don't think we should be using it in our, in our model fitting or testing. So we use pandas uh, method data.drop. We tell it what field to drop. We could have a list of fields in there, in a list, in square brackets, if we wanted to drop more. In place equals true means do it to data and output data without that without that field. If you didn't have that, you could say have um, data to equals data dot drop passenger ID without the in place is true. And then that would leave the original data the same, but create a new pandas data frame. Um, and then axis equals one says to drop a column. Um, rather than if you do the default is actually zero and it drops a row with that index so you can drop columns in pandas or you can drop rows if you drop columns it's axis equals one in pandas so let's do that did I do that anyway <clears throat> I did do it the reason it's given me a key error is I tried to do it a second time that passenger ID um, was already I'd already deleted it tried to delete it again and it um, threw an error if you got that sort of thing okay just to remind you of some standard um, Python structures what we could do is say try deleting that data and if you hit an error or what's called an exception then do nothing, pass. So if we run that, passenger ID is already gone, which is why we got that error. If we run that now, that should run without an error because it will try it, it will fail. So if I fail, then pass. Um, maybe I actually put in something, I could say print uh, data field did not exist no action taken. So they are there. Okay, so we run that and tried it, it failed because we'd already moved it and so data field did not exist, no action taken. So we, we can tell it went down through the um, the accept. Okay, so next next let's have a it's always good. I'm sure you know this already. It's always good to get a feel of the data before you start fitting um, models, though some would say you should fit the model without any idea, but no, the first thing you get with data is sort of have a, you know, have a swim around in it for a bit, get to know your data a little bit. So let's, before we run our model, let's look at the um, mean values for those that survived and those that didn't survive. Now we do that by we're going to want to select data of only those that survived. And I will commonly write this, and you'll see this commonly done. You split it into two. You can write it all in one line, but you will quite often write the mask, which is what you want to see, um, as mask equals. Don't have to call it mask, just by convention. So mask equals data survived equals one. What that is going to do is it actually behind the scenes gives us a Boolean array of true and false of, and it's true if survived is equal to one. So those that survived. In fact, let's 
da -da -da -da, have a play in here. Let, let's just do mask. Let's just do that first bit. And let's just have a look what the mask actually looks like. And it's the row index for the data and it's a Boolean false or true. When we apply that, das, that mask, we then get just those that survived, um, only those that are, that are true. And then we repeat that by saying now our mask is those that didn't survive. Survival equals zero, and our new died is a data is data applying that mask. So now we get data just for those that have died. So I'll run, run those. Now if we have a, a look at our average values for survived and died, just to see if we get any hint of what's going on, here's our survived. That's good to see that the mean survived is one. Gives us confidence our mask worked. And if we do our died our average um, here, our, our mean survived is, is zero. So, and you might just sort of, I don't know what, what we might, might, might notice from here. 30% um, of survivors were male, for example. 85% of non-survivors were male. You might want to compare that, or you should compare that to what's in the original um, population as, as well. So, or the, the combined population. So it just gives us, um, a, a start with a feel for uh, what was going on. Um, the average fare of those who died was twenty-two pounds. Assume it's pounds. I don't know. Uh, the average fare for those that survived was um, forty-eight pounds. So we start to get a feel of some things that might might make a difference in our in our model. We can, rather than flicking up and down like that, we can put it in a. Um, summary data frames, these, these sort of things are quite useful to do as you get, you will get more used to using pandas and numpy and things like that and constructing little data frames on the fly for example. So summary equals an empty data frame and then summary survived, I'm going to produce a new column which will be the survived mean and summary died, the died mean. So I create that and then if I look at that, here's what I was flicking up down earlier so we can start to compare side by side side bit of a difference in age not perhaps not not much fair um male um where you embarked from seems to make a bit of a difference there um remember you know we're just looking at possible correlations here um so that's yeah a handy thing to do as you're going along is you can always pop it a new data frame put some stuff in there you can also use pandas got um, methods for creating pivot tables you can do it like that if if you like here we did it a bit more a bit more manually okay so our next thing is we've got our data we've had a bit of a look at it we've got rid of one of the columns that we didn't think was going to be particularly um, useful or could be could be confusing the passenger ID because it wasn't an original data field. Now we're going to just split our data into X and and Y. So our X are our features and we're going to use the drop again but here slightly differently. So X is data dot drop survived X is equals one column but no in place equals true. So we're creating a new data frame that is all the data in data apart from survived. And then our Y is our data survived. So if we do that, let's just have a uh, look at it. So X So we're still in a pandas data frame. We haven't got our, if we look along here, we haven't got our survived and then if we look at Y, then um, we've now got that in. This is actually, because it's a single column, it's actually automatically converted it into what's called a pandas series. 
which is similar to a data frame but slightly different. Um, okay, so we've got our x, we've got our y. So we've taken our data, um, we've split it into these are our features that are used to predict and y is our label that we're seeking to predict. Next, we are going to um, split into training and test data sets. And we're going to use train test split, which we imported back at the top from sklearn. And that's a handy dandy function um, for splitting our data um, randomly, that you can set the random seed to control the, uh, the uh, make the randomness or pseudo randomness um, reproducible. Here we're not going to do that. Train test split, take x, text, take y, and test size is 25%. And the syntax is always going to be you. You produce X train, X test, Y train, Y test. You could name those differently, but it's four things that are train and test and X and Y. So this is a pretty standard convention. Call the method, pass it X, pass it Y, say what proportion of the samples do you want to be in the test size. Okay. So, and we can just sort of see do, 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 do. Um, our standard deviation and our, our mean. I've just outputted here just to show that our, this is coming out our um, training set um, has quite different standard deviations and quite different means. I could do that to the test set as well. It's just having a look at what it produces. So now we want to um, set our uh, or standardize our data. So this is what we what we did before. Now, before we standardize based on the whole data set, now we've got training and test set. What we do is standardize based on the mean and standard deviation of the um, training set. So we calculate the mean of the training set and we subtract that from all of the values, whether they're in training or test. We calculate the standard deviation of the training set and we divide our numbers after subtracting the mean by that number for both the training and the test data set. So we stand, we don't standardize training and test independently. We standardize both in the same way and we base that on the mean and standard deviation of the training set. Or you'd use the min and max of the training set if you were doing min max normalization. We're going to define a little function to do that. Um, and this is some. These are the sort of little functions you copy and paste from one thing to another. Uh, X train is type float. We don't actually need that. I'll get rid of that before it appears on your um, your notebooks. Um, so we're going to define our function to standardize the data. It takes X train and X test. SC standard scalar. That was another thing we imported um, back in our import, and also comes from scikit-learn. And the, the way this is done is we fit the scalar based on X train. That's just the syntax you use that comes from scikit-learn. And then we can say train, stan train standardized, bad, should have more white space here, equals our scalar. Um, and then we call the transform method on X train. And then we call the transform method on X test. So this is built a transformer based on the training data and then we apply it to train and test set and then the function returns the standardized training and the standardized test set. 
And now we're going to apply that function x train standard x train x test standardized or STD is and we're going to call that function x train x test. Okay, let's just have a quick look at that. So what we're expecting now is the values to be close to zero or centered around zero, and most of them will be between minus two and plus two, and nearly all should be between minus three and plus three. So let's have a quick look at X train standard, standardized. Now you see it's returned, we passed it a pandas data frame with um, columns, it's returned actually just the values, a numpy array. So if we wanted to look at the first uh, example that's been passed to it, we would say x train zero. And this, each of these is a feature that we pass to it. This is one passenger and these are the standardized values. So each features are now um, uh, all the features on a similar scale. Oh, that's an unusual one there. We've got 3.7, so that's going to be very rare to be outside the range minus 3 to 3, but it, but it will occur. Um, so if we have another a look at another one, so again, you know, they're, they're all on a similar range now, between generally between minus 3 and 3. And our test should be just the same. Okay. So, we'll pause here, so just have a go, look back, go through again, just in your head make sure that you've sort of understood what we've done. We've imported the data, uh, we had a quick look at uh, general information with info and describe. Um, we removed a column that we didn't want to use. We split into training and test data sets, and then we standardized after splitting into test and training data sets, not before. So split first, then standardize, because any new data you have wouldn't have been able to be used for standardization. And we want our test data set to behave as if it's new data. So you standardize on your training set. So you um, split, then standardize. So have a look through that. Get yourself a, another drink, whatever, because we'll come back and we'll fit, fit our model to our standardized data. See you in a bit. Okay, let's fit our model. We've taken our data, cleaned it up a little bit, mostly it's been done before. We split into X and Y, and then we split into training and test data set. And here is the model fit, which after all that, might seem a bit of an anticlimax. This is fitting the logistic regression model. Model equals logistic regression, and again, if you look at our imports, somewhere up, up there, um, we brought that in from sklearn again, and we say model.fit, and we fit it by giving it the train, and uh, training x, normalized, standardized, and the, the y train, the labels. And that's it. And it returns uh, what it, the sort of model construct, if you like. And these are things quite handy to look at because you can actually change though, those are options um, in the um, model fitting. So for example, we're not going to go into kind of all of these. Um, C for example, it's what's called regularization, um, and there's a separate notebook on that in the, the um, uh, Titanic GitHub. Regularization um, basically forces a slight underfitting of the model, so it doesn't fit quite so well. It brings all the coefficients down a little bit and pushes everything slightly towards the mean value of everything. And by doing that, you actually worsen the accuracy on your training fit, but you will normally improve it on your um, test 
what it hasn't seen before. So it, it avoids what's called overfitting a model to your, your training data, where it fits too bespoke to your training data, and that's called regularization. But see other things there, you know, and a, this is very much an introduction, and you can see there's lots of things that you can play with in a model. But having said that, scikit learns default parameters, they're sensible. So it won't be often that you significantly improve a model fit by specifying these individually. It's more to kind of look at um, what, um, um, how you might change the model, what the model doing behind behind the scenes. Um, oh, that, I'll just highlight that one because it's just a nice thing to say what um, Scikit-Learn is also doing behind the scenes and number of jobs equals none is not doesn't limit the number of CPU threads it's using. So if you've got um, a computer with lots of threads, uh, lots of CPU cores, it will use them all. Um, so that's quite quite nice. It does automatic parallel processing of it. It fits for you. Anyway, that's the model fitted. Um, so now let's predict our um, results. We can predict our training by passing our training X features to it. Um, and then the one we're really interested in is let's predict what it hasn't seen before. We pass our test set to it. This is the standardized. Okay, we've predicted. Um, the way prediction works on scikit-learn, if we look at this, is it's given us the class. It's given us, do we think we survived or do we think it, it's, it's not? Some other methods will give you the probability at this point, which you then convert to a class, but we get probability out separately in a different way with scikit-learn. So it's simply model predict Give it your X features or your standardized X features and it returns the class. And we've just got two classes, survived or, or not survived. Um, if your original Y lay class had multiple classes, scikit-learn will automatically construct a multi-class logistic regression model for that. And you'd find your array here could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever, however many different labels um, you've got. So that's our fitting and, and our prediction. But let, let's um, have a look at what our accuracy is. And let me just do, 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 create an extra cell here. Let's just go through through this sort of individually, if you like. What we're interested in is, did our, let's just stick to the test set, looking at it for a moment. Does our test set equal or does our predicted test set equal our actual test set? So this has never been used in the training, So, but we, we've got it. And we're saying, is our prediction equal to our test? And if we just run that cell, what we get is actually a, a pandas series of true, 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 true whole lot missing, then, uh, or well, it's not showing because it's compressed showing what it's um, and then false true 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 so each time it's true it means our prediction matched what actually um, uh, it, it was and what we're interested in what portion have you got right now true and false in python no matter where you are whether in pure python or pandas um, or numpy true and false also behave always like one and zero so if we take what well, we could do and we're going to use, because it's an array we're going to be dealing with we're going to use the numpy functions if we did numpy sum that would tell us for example how many were right in our test set 181 which by itself doesn't really mean that much because we're not quite sure how many um, we had to originally um, but we can also sort of say well how many are wrong with um, bang equals, if you're an American, exclamation mark equals, which means does not equal Y test. So we've got 42 wrong and 182 right. 
if we want to know the proportion that's right, we simply ask for the average, the mean, of are you right or wrong. So that might take just a bit to think through of why that gives us the proportion that's right. Um, but NP mean Y predicted test oops, is equal to Y test will give us our proportion that is right. So we're right 81% of the time. And a logistic regression model like this is often a good baseline. You can then say, OK, my first model is 81% accurate um, on this training test plan. Can I improve that? Can I tweak my model parameters? Will another model type, random forests, support vector machines, neural networks do better? Is there something else I can do to my data to improve it? Logistic regression is a good baseline model. So. This just does the same, it's going to calculate our accuracy on training or accuracy on test. So if we run that, our accuracy on training data is 80%, our accuracy on test data is 81%. Um, that's not bad. I don't know, it depends what accuracy you want, it, it, it's what it, what it is. You'll notice our training data isn't more accurately predicted than our test data. If we, test data. If we were suffering from model overfitting, we would see training data um, having a high accuracy uh, than test data. Neural networks in particular, if you don't do anything to avoid it, are very susceptible to overfitting. They can basically get 100% accuracy on the data they're trained on and then lower accuracy on the, the test data. And you then have to make a more deliberate attempt to um, uh, to avoid overfitting. But we'll cover that on the, the more advanced thing. We did have a technique here to over, avoid overfitting because we had our regularization. So if we adjusted that, I can't remember whether C goes, um, you'd have to have a look, uh, whether C, increase C for um, to increase regularization or whether you need to reduce C for, a, for a regularization. Okay, anyway, that's our uh, training test set accuracy. So we can now say we've got a model that's of eight, you know, confident that's 80% um, accurate. Um, let's just throw in some quick bit of Python um, here as well. We look at this numerous um, uh, decimal places here. Let's say we only want it to one decimal place. The best way to do that now from Python 3.6 onwards is to do it with what's called F strings. We put an F before our string starts and then we enclose what we want to have as a value in curly brackets and then end. The, the string and then we specify its precision and we do that um, with let me hope get this right um, colon and then if I want to specify the width it takes I could put that but I'm not I'm going to allow the width to be flexible 0.2 f and f means it's a float with two decimal places And I've done that wrong. There, sorry. Enclosed it all in the curly braces. So I put in what I, the value I want to print, and then I put in its um, precision. So if I put in 10 spaces there, for example, you'd see it kind of shifts out there. So it just helps you get alignment of big numbers if you want, but commonly you'll use it naught. Let's do it to three decimal places. Okay. Okay, so pause, have a look at that. If you want to, go back. I quite recommend it. And Maybe adjust to C, go down to say 0 0.01 and up to 100 in 10 fold jumps and just see what, see what that does to, to accuracy of your training and test data set and see whether there's one that, that improves it. 
maybe go up in steps of three, point zero zero one, zero zero three, point oh one, point oh three, one, three, etc. Um, you'll probably find you might be able to tweak it a little bit, but not not much. So the the default value is normally pretty good. But have a have a look at that. Um, probably don't change anything else at at, at this point. Um, and check your accuracy and uh, get a feel for that. Okay, and we'll come back and we'll have a look at probabilities. So I just quickly added, realized I didn't say how to change things. In your model, if you want to change C, the place you put it is when you define your model. So le model equals logistic regression, C equals um, 0 0.001. And by the magic of YouTube, I could I checked um, from just a few seconds ago. If you want to increase your regularization, so it reduces overfitting of the model, pulls more things towards the mean, you reduce C to increasingly lower values. So if you had a very low value for C, I'm not sure how low you could go, something like that. That would effectively pull everything very close to the average value and it wouldn't use the the features as much to fit the data. So have a have a play with that. And it's capital capital C. And then the training bit is is just the same. Okay. Now I'll see you in a bit. Okay, so next bit we're going to look at model weights, as machine learners tend to call them, or model coefficients, as statisticians tend to call them. And this is how, for each feature, how much is the outcome survival related to, to that feature? It's perhaps worth saying at this point, logistic regression in this form doesn't take into account interactions between features. Um, each feature is independent and it affects survival independently of any other feature in the way we formulated it. Whereas some other techniques like neural networks and random forest will automatically take feature interaction into account. With logistic regression, if we wanted to look at um, interaction between features, we would specifically calculate them and um, so these are called polynomial features so you would have age multiplied by passenger class for example um, both normalized before before you do that so you start to in, in, introduce extra features which are combinations of them both and you could have threefold interactions but you start to get uh, for logistic regression it starts to get quite an awful lot of data fields to, to enter whereas other techniques will deal with it automatically. But um, back on the um, Titanic GitHub and Titanic page on um, Python Healthcare you'll see um, expanding the number of features is one of the notebooks um, feature expansion. Um, and sometimes what you might do is expand the features out first find out what's important including the interactions and then you re in your final model you reduce the number of features so you might lose some features themselves but keep it as interactions you could do um, so that's all part of how you're dealing with feature uh, so feature engineering it's called um, one of the advantage of dealing with neural networks is you don't need to do that the network is effectively doing that all for you if combinations of features are important, it'll find them, should find them. Um, if individual features are important, it will use just the individual features. Okay, so, but having said we're not looking at interactions at this point, we're just looking at individual features, what's, what's important? And for that we want to get out the model coefficients, or the model weights. And scikit-learn has that in a um, output of the model. So model is what we fitted earlier and we're going to say our coefficients are model coef, coef underscore 
and then zero. Now, we've got only one label we're trying to predict, survive or not, uh, but we still need the zero. If we were trying to predict three different things, we would actually have coefficients for one of them you don't need, and then it, it's the well, you'd have you'd still have it effectively in that you'd have zero, one, and two, for example, for different different uh, numbers of, of labels. Um, but if you're dealing with binary, you just know to put it down as um, coefficient, and then in square brackets, zero. So the higher, so this is the relationship between a feature and the probability of survival. Um, and so if this is positive, this says as you increase the, the original value of that feature, or the standardized value, then you increase the probability of survival, and vice versa. Um, as that feature value reduces, your survival probability reduces. Um, if the coefficient is negative, it means you've got an opposite relationship. It means that as you increase a feature value originally, then the more that increases, the lower the chance of survival. So the sign of the coefficient, whether it's positive or negative, tells us is this uh, feature correlated with improved survival if it's positive or reduced survival if it's, if it's negative. And the fact that we've standardized our features means we can compare the absolute values of the features as well. Um, so if one is plus 0.5, then that's going to be a lot more important than one that's plus 0 0.005. Whereas with non-standardized, you have to kind of take into account what's the scale of the original data. But we're dealing with standardized data. So the sign will give us the direction, the value will give us its relative importance. So let's have a look. And first of all, don't be surprised that this will look a bit um, unfathomable, perhaps. What we've got is an array. We've got an array and our first feature, and I can't remember what it is, which is part of the reason this is a bit unfathomable as it is, we'll deal with that in a second, um, is this is 10 to the minus one, so that's minus 0 0.8. So whatever the first feature is, is negatively correlated with um, probability of survival. And that looks to be one of the higher magnitude values, uh, because this 10 to the minus 4, that, that'll mean it's close to zero. So that'll be 0 0.00058. Um, anyway, we can see, and here we've got one that's not correlated at all. Red have them absolutely zero. So we have our model weights, but there's a comment here, it's not very readable to us. So one of the first things we will, what we will commonly do is put that into a pandas data frame and put the column labels, feature labels back in. So coefficient data frame, we're going to create an empty data frame. We're then going to get the column names for our X. And we can do that simply if you have a pandas data frame let's do it do, do, do. Um, if we list if we apply the method list to a pandas data frame it will give the columns so they're the columns so we're going to create a new column in our data frame that will be the list of the features because this is maintained in order when scikit-learn fix it um, then we're going to give it its coefficient and this will be signed negative or positive. Then I'm going to, what I do here is take the absolute value so it removes the sign. So if it's minus two, it's going to convert it to two. So the sign tells us the direction, the absolute value tells us the relative importance. And then I'm going to sort the data frame by values, I'm going to sort it um, it's as if it's an Excel spreadsheet, if you like. I'm going to sort it by this absolute value, ascending equals false. 
So it's going to give us the highest values at the top. In place is true. Again, like other pandas data frames, we could either change our original data frame, which we've done here with an in place is true, or we could create a new data frame. In place is true is, is the same as doing cof data frame equals because this is going to replace that data frame with the sorted bit. It's just slightly tidier to do the in place of true. So let's do that. And we're going to, let's just get rid of that. And then let's look at our data frame. Now, we've used random. We haven't controlled the train test split, so yours might be a bit different to this. Um, in terms of, particularly when things aren't so important, you might find the order a bit switched. Um, but hopefully you should get the most important thing is the, big with, the thing with the biggest magnitude of our standardized data. So everything's now on the same scale, which means we can treat the value of the coefficient as telling us effectively the importance of the feature is whether you're male and male is negatively correlated with survival. So if you are male, you are less likely to survive. And this is the most important feature, it seems, in our, in our model. Next comes the class, which again, if you are a higher number class, which means a lower class, so third class, has a lower survival than um, first class. Similarly with age is actually found a link there. So the, uh, again, as you get older, because it's negative here, the chance of survival as you get older is reduced. These aren't necessarily causal, remember, we're dealing with correlations here. Um, cabin number imputer, that's an interesting one. So basically if the cabin number was missing, this is given an original value of one. Cabin number of missing, so you don't have a cabin really. So this is probably linked very much with class. Uh, if you did not have a cabin number, you had a lower chance of survival. Uh, whereas if you were in cabin E, you had a higher chance of survival, though the importance is coming coming down now. So I don't know, perhaps cabin E were the posher, posher cabins. Whereas cabin letter C had a lower uh, chance of survival. So we might we might think cabin C's were not as good as cabin E's. But again, could be confounding variables. It's correlation, not cause and effect. But it tells us what's predictive in our, in our feature set. Um, fair, interestingly, is down the bottom. And it could be just because it's kind of put, if that, relate, if that relates to class, it's put, it's put it all into um, class rather than, rather than fair. So anyway, that's that's our um, those are our coefficients. So we can start to get a sense of what's what's important. Remember, there are no interactions here, and then we could produce a simplified model. There are separate notebooks on different methods for producing simplified models, but one simple method here could be why well, I say I'm going to take the top 10 features. Maybe that's all the computational power I've got is to manage 10 features. So you'll just simply take the 10 most important with their coefficients here and use that in the model. Um, elsewhere it's described what you can do is now you've got this order is you can add in one feature at a time and see what change in accuracy you get by adding, adding uh, cumulatively adding features. Or you can do the opposite. You can take one feature out at a time and see um, what, um, what that does to, to accuracy. There are other ways of adding and subtracting as well, I should say, rather than just using this list, um, which is why there are, I think there are three notebooks on feature selection back on the, the, the Titanic page. So we've got our main three influences, whether you're male, what, what class you were, and um, what, what your, your age was. Okay, so just have a look at that, see if it makes sense, go back and compare to our original 
description of the data do we think that that makes sense and then it's on to the last bit of this which will be looking at probabilities rather than absolute do I think you're going to survive or not so see you in a bit for that okay so last little session and then I'll point you to if you fancy doing one of these yourself uh, as an exercise point you to worksheet that loads up data for you and then you can get get going on it um, so the, the last thing is rather than showing a classification survive or not um, can we um, look at what we think the probability of survival is um, and it's very simple really um, so our normal prediction um, uses model dot predict. So if we look at the first 10 examples, uh, we get an array survived, died, 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 survived, 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 died, survived, died. If we want to look at the probabilities for that, so you know maybe we're interested in um, finding those patients with the highest probability of readmission or, or something like that. Um, then rather than just a classification we'll take probability and then we might just sort of skim off the top the top ones um, or we might say well I'm interested in those with more than an 80% probability of survival um, so model predict proper underscore proper rather than predict so very simple now what's returned is our probability now probability per person is two values one is the not survived and the other is survived so if we had multiple classes here is are you green are you a cat a dog or a bird if we had three classes we would find three um, values here for, for each in, individual one so if we want to um, this way numpy syntax you get used to um, it in a bit if we, what we've got here is a NumPy array, if we wanted just the probability of survival, we would then say, take all that, I want all rows, colon, and I want column one, because that's column zero on the left, column one on the right. Hope this works. Um, now I've got my probability of survival rather than just prob that my probability is not surviving and surviving. So the first one, survival, was 93%. We see these are pretty, the next two, pretty pretty darn low probability of survival, 7%, 4%. Then I've got, to, we've got one here that it's classified as not surviving, but it's a 42% chance of survival. So we're, we're more, the, uh, closer to the, you know, more uncertain about this passenger um, than than the others um, and then we've got a high probability of survival and then some closer to 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 zero again we could look at th those individuals um, if we wanted so this is in X test I mean let's just have a look um, let me put in a, an extra code cell now X test standard let me just check is this um, is this a pandas data frame or a numpy array uh, it's a numpy array uh, it was x test standardized came from x test okay so this is going to be our um, the x values that went went in now I don't need to use an index here but if I wanted to select just the first one in pandas I, if it's um to get the first one that actually has an index of 290 because that's its index number uh, here if I wanted to take the first row I would do I lock I lock zero and that should give me the 290 one um, Except it's got oh yes, its name there is two hundred and ninety. So this this one has got a high chance of survival. Um, so let's have a look. We're not male. Um, 
where's our class? We're first, so we've got a first class young female. So if we look at one with a low chance of survival, which would be our third one, which is I lock two, our third one, zero indexed, zero one two, um, bum, bum. then what we got, we got it, they're, they're young, uh, third class male. So third class male, doomed. Um, and then, but then the next one along is, is less certain. So this is I lock three. So let's have a look. They're older, um, they're third class, third class female. So we've got being third class is bad, being female is, is good. Um, so you can see why that might, it's not so clear cut. Um, so, you know, I mean, the, the bottom line is for any individual um, traveller there, we can, we can get their individual probabilities. OK, that's all for, for this lesson. So what we did, we've done a standard, we've done what is really the sort of benchmark standard of classification. Before you go on to neural networks, complicated random forests, um, do a logistic regression. And then often you're kind of looking at incremental increases in, in accuracy from, from, from there. So we've built our linear regression, logistic regression model. We bought in our data, we cleaned it up a bit just to get rid of a column that we didn't want. We split it into training and test sets. 25% random um, went into the test set. That was not used to train the model. We then standardized the data based on the mean and standard deviation of the training set. We then fitted the model. We just used default parameters, normally good in sklearn, but you can twiddle with them if, if, if you want. Um, and then we predicted our um, test set and we compared that to what their actual values were, came up with our 81% accuracy. Um, and then, um, uh, what did we do then? We looked at our coefficients, our weights, to see which were most important, and it was class and whether you were male and your your age. And um, then finally, we've looked at probabilities, and we could actually go back and look what's our accuracy. What, if we sort of take those ones, it's more sure of our 81% accuracy will almost certainly go up if we say, well, you know, of those that you think you've got. 80% chance of survival, not survival. How, how accurate is our model for those? And we'll find it will be better. But, and, but our probability shows us there, there are some um, passengers that are closer to not, you know, closer to sort of not sure, prob equal probability of survival or, or non-survival, like our, our third class uh, young, young female. OK, hope that's clear enough. What we'll do next is, well, have a look through that. So just make sure you got those steps and get those steps ingrained. I probably repeated them too much, but, you know, import your data, do, do any clear cleaning that, that you need to do, um, split, um, rand split randomly into training and test, um, then standardize, then fit your model, then test it uh, on, the, on the data and then look at your model weights, coefficients and output probabilities. If, if you're interested in individual um, individual cases. Okay, so have a look at that, come back, and I'll show you an example where you can, you're gonna build it from scratch. Basically, we'll just pull in the data for you, and you can do it on Colab, um, or on the other one, Binder Hub, um, or locally, if you got it, got it. Okay, so have a look at that, take a break, particularly if you're about to try one yourself, and see you in a bit. Okay, try one yourself if you want to. Um, you'll see after a bit, you can use copy and, pay, copy and paste a lot. You're constantly going through similar steps. The other notebooks will help build the knowledge over time. First of all, just I just get some data sets, going to give you one here, show you where to find some others in, in a moment, and just have a practice putting these, these things um, together. Okay, so 
let's go back to our GitHub, uh, Python Healthcare, Titanic Survival, going to go to the GitHub, going to open in Colab, do, 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 must tidy up those checkpoints and go down and you're going to go to HSMA exercise if you want to try one for yourself. So, and I'll show you what, what the data looks like, just explain. This is using some clinical data, and this is predicting whether uh, a patient would receive a particular treatment or not. Um, and uh, we're going to, well, let's, let's load the data. So the only one, the only library I'm using at this point, so you'll need to add any, import any other libraries you want to use. I'm just importing pandas to read the CSV. Um, so I always read CSV and pandas for, the, for this sort of stuff. Um, okay. Uh, download is true, particularly if you're working in Colab or Binder Hub. Um, if you're not, the data should be around lo locally on your computer if you've if you downloaded the zip file. So uh, we give it the address and read the, the CSV. So I didn't dwell on this much last time. It's another magic magic thing about pandas. It can read data tables on um, CSVs from, from the interwebs. It's got methods to look for tables on web pages and convert uh, a web page into a series of pandas data frames if they appear to be there. All, all kind of magic. Um, this creates a data directory if it's not already there and then saves it. So HSMA stroke CSV. Then we're going to load that back up. Um, this really is only needed if you're not downloading, but it won't do any harm to reread it back in. Um, convert to float again, and then let's have a look at what the data looks like. So it's stroke. The treatment is whether you receive a clot busting drug. So stroke, about 80-85% of the time is due to a clot in the brain. If you get to the patient early enough, you can give a drug which dissolves that clot, breaks it down, digests it. It's basically a, um, a sort of chemical enzyme that, that, that digests the clot. Um, so let's have a look at this data. Yes, yes, yes. So it's going to load up its libraries, load up the data, um, and then display it. OK, so this is our data table. So it's all processed for you again. You don't need to do any data processing beyond the normal stuff of splitting into X and Y and um, uh, splitting into, random, into test sets and training sets and then scaling. So clock buster given, this is our label. This is in our first column here. So that's our, that's our label. You want to separate that into Y, get rid of it from the X. Never use your label to train your model, um, though it's pretty obvious if you have because you're at 100% accuracy, or should do, or very close to. Um, the reason it might not give you exactly 100% accuracy is because of regularization in, in the model. Um, this is a one hot encoding, so these patients here all went to, that we can see, went to hospital two. Then we have things like are you male, uh, what's your age? Are you 80 plus is a separate field. Um, we probably also predict whether they'll survive the Titanic at the same time. Um, onset time of stroke, known, um, best estimate, not known, precise. Number of comorbidities that you've got, have you got two or more? Um, have you got congestive heart failure, hypertension, atrial fibrillation, diabetes? Have you had a transient, previous transient ischemic episode? Um, sometimes called a mini stroke. Do you have any kind of comorbidity? Are you on antiplatelets like warfarin? Um, no, yes, not known, and so forth. More features about, about the patients going forward. So your job, should you wish to give it a go now or later, whenever you want, is this is what you're trying to predict. Clot buster given. That's your label. Here's the rest of the data. Um, there is, uh, let's have a look, dun, dun, dun. data.info. 
704, no, wait a minute, how many records have we got? 1,862 records in all. So, um, yeah, Philly Bits, go and have a, have a go with that, see what you get. Uh, struggling with anything, um, if you're doing it around this HSMA course, post up on the Slack channel during the day or, you know, in the days either before or, or after, because I'll put this YouTube link up before. Um, on the day you'll get a should get a pretty quick response outside of the day you'll get a response but might be a bit slower um, let's say let us know how, how you get on and what what accuracy you get okay have fun just one last session little bit just just to show you Kaggle um, in a second and how that can be a useful resource okay enjoy okay Kaggle um, Kaggle is a source of data, it's so you can try things, it's a source of people putting notebooks and solutions for things that can be a source of trying to find out how a problem might be um, tackled. Um, they put up competitions uh, where the winner who gets the best results um, wins money, up to a million pounds. Um, Netflix put up a competition of how good could you predict whether somebody would like a particular film that's recommended to them or not. Would they watch? Because Netflix want to present you with uh, your choices of things you might want to watch and they want you to click, yes, I want to watch that to keep you on Netflix. And they, they, they had a prize for a million pounds. Um, that particular competition was won actually not by a really, really refined model, but using a technique that's uh, becoming increasingly common called an ensemble, where you actually build, rather than trying to super refine a single model, you might have five different models of, and it could be five different models of the same kind, but adjusted parameters in there. Um, or it could be five completely different models, and then you take, well, the simplest thing is a majority vote from them all, and, and take that, so that's called ensemble modeling. Um, okay, so let's have a quick look at Kaggle. An example that I've used it for in, the, in just the last few weeks, I was one, uh, I wanted to do some stuff with brain image scans because we're thinking of using it in, in stroke. Um, but you don't want to go through all the fuss of getting brain image scans and all the, you know, going to a hospital saying, can we have some of that? And you know, going through all the ethics. So I went to Kaggle and they have you know, it's not exactly what you want, the data you want, but it's close enough to get going on something and checking, is this stuff we think we can we can do and be useful? Um, so Kaggle, K-A-G-G-L-E, Kaggle.com. Um, you can register, um, uh, sign in to just keep track of what data sets you've downloaded and stuff, but you don't don't have to. So if I go to data sets, for example, so here I want to look at um, data sets and actually we search here uh, under create public data sets search. For example, I might look at, is there anything on hospital readmission that I could have a play with and see whether that could be useful and how do I go about doing that? And it's pulled up um, a number of data sets it thinks may be um, relevant. And then you have to look and say, is it, you know, diabetic patients readmission prediction? Maybe that's good enough to get me going. So for me, it was um, brain MRI. Uh, I think I then put in cancer or tumour. And there's actually lots of data sets available, the brain images with classification. So you can get going on checking um, uh, how how easy is it to classify uh, a brain image scan as tumorous or non-tumorous. Um, so Kaggle is a wonderful, wonderful resource and there's sort of, you can search for notebooks, what, what have other people done before and how they've done it. Um, so it, it's great and then they've got the competitions going. So that's, that's Kaggle. Um, so the other place just to uh, keep flogging my own stuff um, Titanic Survival from Python Healthcare. Have a look through, may, if you're interested, what else is here, what might be of interest to you. There are individual notebooks on um, how to measure accuracy 
rather than just a plain accuracy because it you may make you want to know perhaps accuracy of each class what are your false positives false negatives and how do you trade off false positives and false negatives is receiver operator characteristic curves feature selection etc um, so we're not trying to do everything in the, the tutorials we've got here but I have tried to put everything that is of general use in classification and that's not hyper specialized um, up on this this site here um, to show you how to do things okay uh, and for those that want to carry on doing this and can make the next one we'll be doing um, Actually, I haven't fully decided what we'll be doing. We'll probably cover a couple of, of these things, stratified, k-fold, validation, we ought to do. Perhaps look at other accuracy measurements. And we will also look at um, neural nets as, as well. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay, so we'll see you, see you next time.